In the last video, I showed you how to make an amazing overnight sourdough bread. It featured the perfect crust, an amazing fluffy crumb, and incredible taste. All you had to do for the whole process, mix everything together, let it sit overnight, do one stretch and fold in the morning, bake it, and then enjoy your fluffy bread. So the bread turned out really amazing the last time, but can we go even lazier? Can we go even simpler? I want to develop a method that's so lazy that there's no more excuses not to bake sourdough bread. Something so simple that everybody can do it. And I want to take a completely different route this time. Something that's so simple that you're probably going to be wondering, can this actually work? So in this experiment, I want to try the really laziest possible setup. So let's jump to the whiteboard and let me show you the crazy idea that I have in mind. So this is roughly the regular process that you have for sourdough bread. You're kneading at the start, then you're doing a couple of stretch and folds in between and in the end you are shaping your dough. Now I want to come up with a method where I at least eliminate the shaping because I think that's very hard especially if you're new to baking and also all the stretch and folds in between. Regarding the kneading I will show you one method where you can also altogether eliminate the kneading but then another method that requires a little bit of kneading. So let's quickly talk about when you should knead. There are two things about kneading. First of all, there's just mixing your dough together, homogenizing the ingredients. That's something that you always have to do regardless of your flour. However, if you're baking wheat, then you have a lot of gluten. And in that case, you want to align the gluten strands. And that you do by kneading your dough. If you want to make something like a rye bread, old spelt, emmer or einkorn, then there's very little gluten, you don't have to align it, and that's why no kneading is required. I'm going to be showing you two options in this video. Actually, it's going to be three. We're going to be making a regular bread flour style bread, one with whole wheat, and then an additional one with rye, the flour of Germany. So if you're the kind of person that's super lazy, then the right hand category might be a little bit more interesting. For wheat, you in general want to develop a little bit of a gluten network. So if you want to bake a bread like this, a batard, a bunny style, bunny shaped looking bread that has nice oven spring, then you have to knead a little bit. That's because you want to make sure that your gluten holds together nicely. That makes sure that your bread is going to spring upwards inside of the oven. If you don't care so much about this shape, if it's okay for you to use a loaf pan, then we might be able to skip a couple of those steps. So the idea that I want to test, I don't know if that's going to work out or not. I want to just mix all the ingredients, knead a little bit, and then I want to place it directly inside of the loaf pan for the whole process. So there's not going to be any stretch and folds in between. There's going to be no shaping. The dough is going to sit from start to finish inside of the loaf pan. That will make a super, super, super lazy bread, probably the laziest bread there is. But for this style of bread, I think the method that I showed you the last time, the overnight lazy sourdough bread, that's the laziest method you can go for this style of bread. But if we are okay with this bread, which I still think in general is great because it's easier to make slices, for instance, um, then this is totally okay. So I'm going to be kneading everything and then I'll just put it directly into the loaf pan. Plus, I'll also make a rye version out of this where we just homogenize everything at the start. We don't do any gluten development. We toss everything directly in there. So let me show you. I'm super excited to see if this is going to work out or not. I already added 400 grams of strong bread flour, 320 grams of room temperature water, 8 grams of salt and around 40 grams of sourdough starter. If you don't have a sourdough starter, don't worry. It's very easy to make one. I'm linking a recipe right here that will get you a super nice and active sourdough starter. You do this once and then you have a sourdough starter for the rest of your life. And it's only going to become better from bread to bread. Now I'm going to be kneading this with my stand mixer, but you could definitely knead everything completely with your hands. It's just that I'm feeling even a little bit extra lazy. So let's knead that and then make the second dough. And ta-da, that's our dough. Make sure that you got a good gluten development. Do the window pane test, that's exactly what you want. If you don't have it, you wanna be kneading a little bit more. I personally like to knead here on the bench. This bench kneading really creates superb dough strength. 
this only works because your surface is sticky the dough sticks to it and then we can nicely fold it on top of itself now we are going to be extracting a small piece of the dough which will be our fermentation meter this will tell us exactly when the dough is done. This depends on your flour. The more gluten you have, the longer you can ferment. I recommend you to start with a 25% size increase, but I know this flour can go up to a 100% size increase. And no matter the temperatures, the temperatures always change. It doesn't matter. This way you will always nail your fermentation, which is the single most important aspect of sourdough baking. I'm now just going to round this up To do that, at a 45 degree angle, push into the dough and then pull it over the surface. And now comes the unthinkable. We are going to be placing this directly in our loaf pan. Now for the loaf pan, I really recommend you to get some sort of non-stick vegetable oil, else your dough might be sticking. This really does wonders and after a few uses, you don't even have to use it anymore. And now all I'm doing is, I'm taking this dough and I'm placing it inside. I'm placing this dough in a plastic bag because I don't want the dough to dry out now. And now let's spread our sample a little bit. And I'm marking it with a pan. And I know once it has increased here that my dough is ready. Same thing again, I'm just covering this because I don't want this to dry out. And now if you are that whole wheat lover, we are making the same version again using a whole wheat flour. I'm using 400 grams of strong whole wheat flour. That's very important. That's a flour that has a lot of protein. And just look at all that delicious bran here in the flour. This flour is one of my favorites. I'm going to be linking it in the description below. Whole wheat in general absorbs more water. I was going for 80% hydration, which is 80 grams of water per 100 grams of flour for this one here. And now for this one, I'm going way higher. I'm going for 90%. So that's for 400 grams of flour, around 360 grams. The same thing again, around eight grams of salt. That's the European Union's recommendation. And then again, 40 grams of sourdough starter. And now we will be kneading this again. And then same thing as with this one, put it into the loaf pan directly. See you in a bit. And dough number two is ready. And check this out. Great gluten development at close to 100% hydration. This flour just absorbs so much water. Same thing again. Let's extract a piece of the dough. Now we will round this up just like the last time and then into the oiled loaf pan. Same thing like last time, putting this into a plastic bag. I'm going to be marking my sample here. And then next up, we are making the most simplest, the third version, the most simplest of them all. And you will be surprised how simple that one is actually to make. I'm using a mixture of rye flour, cracked rye seeds, and some lentil flour. So this has a very, very low gluten content. And this is what I want you to learn from this video. Similar flowers would be einkorn, emmer, old spelt, for instance. But yeah, also gluten-free flowers would work in a similar way. And this is really so simple because all we have to do is we have to homogenize this and then we're done. For wheat, we have to knead. But for this, it's just mixing everything together. And that's about it. I'm using a little bit more because I'm gonna be using my large loaf pan. I only have two and this large one. So I'm going to be using one kilogram of this mixture and 900 grams of water. So it's a very highly hydrated dough. But that's what I love about this recipe. This is one of my favorite breads because it's so simple to make. Then we're using 2% salt again, which in this case is 18 grams and 10% sourdough starter again, which is 90 grams. 
So all I'm going to do now is I'm going to start homogenizing everything and this time I'm also just going to be using my hand. It's a rye dough and rye unfortunately is very very sticky. But as I said before you can be doing this with any other gluten-free flour as well. So much simpler than kneading and just look at this soupy consistency. Being German we don't let anything go to waste. And I mean, that's about it. This has maybe been one minute of work. This has to be the laziest bread that you can make. And that's it. That's about all the magic we are doing for this dough. And now with the spatula, I'm going to be transferring this to another bowl. You see, no gluten development at all. So it's time now to also prepare our loaf pan, just like the others. This one is a little bit larger and that's why I also have been using more flour for loaf pans. You just need to double check what the instructions say, how much flour you can use for it. It's a little bit of a gamble always for me, but it's something you'll get a hang of after using your loaf pan for the first few times. And this is so easy much easier than with wheat-based doughs. And that's what I like about this loaf pan. It comes with a lid. So I'm closing this and then same thing again. I'm waiting for this to roughly double in size and then this, this is ready to be baked. So all the three doughs have been made. And now it's just waiting time. Let's have a look at a time lapse of how the samples are growing. And voila, here are the doughs around 10 hours later. And look at how nicely they all increased in size. And so what I find quite interesting here, that is this sample here. Um, check how it didn't have, it doesn't have so big pockets of air, right? And here we got the rye mixture pretty much. And that's interesting because this flour is easier to inflate because it has less gluten than this one. Cool, right? Well, what does it mean for the crumb structure? How could you use this to get a nicer open crumb? <laughs> And the whole wheat has also nicely increased in size. Okay, what I could be doing now is I could directly bake them. But in my case, since it's already relatively late, I'd rather have them tomorrow morning. And that's why I will be moving them to the fridge now. Back into the plastic bags and into the fridge where they will just sit for 12 hours, 24 hours, however much you like. So they will each go back into the plastic bag. What I just don't want now is that they start to stick to the plastic bag. That's why I'm just sprinkling them with a little bit of flour. They will increase even further slightly in the fridge. And yes, I don't want this to stick because then the, the structure, the crumb that we built would now be damaged. Very gentle, very careful. The dough samples here, I won't throw them away. I will put them into my discard starter jar and make a delicious bread out of it. It's a really great bread, which I think has incredible flavor. See you tomorrow. Good morning. The doughs have increased even more in size. We have to bake this now and we're baking it right straight out of the fridge. For those two, for the wheat based ones, we want to do a small incision with the razor blade. For this one here, for the rye one, don't even worry about it. We don't have to do that. So all I'm doing is a quick cut through the middle. This allows the dough to you can also just repeat it one more time. This allows the dough to grow through that incision inside of the oven. And that's it. Now we're just gonna bake that. 
at 230 degrees Celsius. And I'm going to be placing another tray for baking on top. This makes sure that the heat transfer isn't too high. We want the dough to not form a crust too quickly. That allows the dough to spring up way more inside of the oven. Let's bake it now. So the bread is done the moment the core temperature reaches 95 degrees Celsius. And for that, using a thermometer is the easiest. Afterwards, if it's not dark enough yet, you can just leave it in the oven for as long as you like until it has the color. But for making bread in a loaf pan like this, this thermometer is definitely a big help because baking times might be different for you and me. It depends on the size of your loaf pan as well. Upper bottom heat and then the 230 degrees Celsius. With other doughs, we would have to preheat the oven but here we don't. This is my oven and here there is a heating element near the bottom and another one on top. This is my rack and on this rack I will just be placing the loaf pan. This tray here on top is relatively important because this shields your dough from this heating element. At the same time during the baking process the water from the dough starts to evaporate and it's going to be trapped below. This means you have a very very steamy environment and that's what you want when you want your dough to spring upwards. You don't want the crust to form too quickly. For regular bread, you would always be preheating your oven. That's important because you want some sort of gel consistency to form. With that gel, your dough is able to hold its shape and it can spring upwards in the oven. Especially important if you want to make a batard like this one. However, in our case, we have the loaf pan and the loaf pan gives great support. And this means we don't have to preheat our oven. So bonus points here. This recipe is even simpler and perfect for lazy people. No preheating required. And voila, ah, the scoring here. I probably should have skipped scoring this all together. But now the biggest moment of truth. Does it come out of the loaf pan? Ah, no. This was what I was most scared about. Two hours later. Oh. Mm. This is nice and fluffy. I'm gonna put both of them back to the oven just that they get a little bit more coloring also from the bottom. And the rye loaf. Nice. I think here everything went according to plan, but as you can see, it still needs to get a little bit more coloring now from the top. So I'm removing the lid. I'll leave it in here for now. And it also goes back to the oven. And last but not least, the rye version. Oh, and it comes out so much nicer. Look at that, <laughs> quite a symmetrical loaf. So here we are with the beauties. I'm going to let them cool down and then we're gonna check how they look from the inside. Here our sandwich bread. A little bit of an issue here on the right and also here this cut, it simply didn't do the difference. From the bottom, it looks nice. It's also very fluffy. The whole wheat bread, it also didn't open as up as much as I hoped. But let's check the crumb. And here, the German classic, also known as the brick, a beautiful rye loaf. So as you can see here, in terms of oven spring, um, it's almost similar to the whole wheat bread. However, normally I do get more oven spring from the whole wheat breads. And I think that's because uh, lack of dough strength. However, here, this one, if you just compare it, this one has more oven spring, but still not as much. So I think there are a few areas that could possibly be improved on the next iteration. So the sandwich bread. Wow, look at 
this fluffiness. This is so good. Whole wheat. Also nice and fluffy. <laughs> Not the most beautiful shape, but still, I would say quite good. And the brick. Okay, I probably should have waited even a little bit more before slicing this because this is still somewhat warm. And maybe I could even have baked it for a few more minutes. Oh, but the flavor this has, this is so good. I bet it's going to taste very, very, very good. All of them again next to each other. From a fluffy perspective, the wheat versions are very fluffy. Just look at this nice consistency. Typical rye bread here. That's what I expect from a rye bread. But now let's give it a shot and taste. Mmm. Very hearty taste. This is Germany. <laughs> So good, fluffy, great flavor as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. Also, super good. All right, quick recap on this experiment. So the next time I'm definitely going to be using a little bit more of that non-stick oil because I had issues of my dough sticking to the loaf pan. This is always some trouble that I have with the loaf pan. I think maybe we could even have needed a little bit less at the start. That would save a little bit more time probably. The scoring that I did, it didn't really come out. I think that's because the dough just in general relaxed too much. So in that case, no scoring is necessary. In fact, on the whole wheat bread, it even had a little bit of a negative impact. It degassed the dough a little bit. The dough just wasn't able to hold the structure. But overall, I'm super happy with how they turned out. All with so little work. Okay, I think that's uh, enough for the recap. I would be super curious to hear your thoughts on what I can improve on this recipe. Please do share it in the comments section. Is this a bread that you're going to try? Do you think there's even a lazier option? So thank you very much for watching. And as always, may the gluten be with you. See you. I'm going to eat all this bread now.